Okay, we're at 1230. Should I just start or is somebody going to give me the cue? I think you're good to go, Rick. We have a short amount of time. We've got a nice big audience. So why don't you just jump right in? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Rick Treitman. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Adobe and with me um, in the chat and you can see them on screen are Donna Caldwell and Jason Katzoff, my colleagues. Um, what we're going to talk about today is reading. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know um, that we've got a problem here in the United States, because when we go to test our students um, at the fourth, eighth and twelfth grades, we find that only about a third of them um, are reading proficiently. And I'm sure this is uh, not news to you. Um, this translates all the way into adulthood, where a majority of adults in the United States are reading below the sixth grade level. And a recent study by the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy um, in association with the Pew um, put the cost, the annual cost uh, to this country at $2.2 trillion. And a lot of this cost is attributed to people who cannot um, rise in their, in their occupations because uh, the reading problems that are holding them back. So one of the things we as technologists like to ask is, you know, how can we make this better? And um, you sort of shoot for the moon and say, well, what if we could just invent a pair of magic reading glasses that could make everybody a reader as soon as they put them on? Um, you know, you might have some kind of diagnostic um, that would indicate what pair of reading glasses these people need. And that diagnostic uh, might look something like this, where you'd vary um, the, uh, the formatting of the text and see how people read as the text changed. But then as you started to bring the text together, uh, I think people would be having a very hard time. Certainly, I would have a hard time reading this. And if you made it even smaller, um, you would be creating a problem for, for even the best readers. And what I'm approximating here is what many people see when they look at a fixed page of text. It's a, an effect that the reading uh, community calls crowding. Um, now imagine that you, you suffer from crowding and uh, you're looking at a hard to read font. So what I'm showing you is an approximation of the font used on the very first typeset book, at least in Western civilization. Here's a page from Gutenberg's Bible. And um, even if I could read uh, the Latin, I think I'd have a hard time um, deciphering the characters given uh, what I'm looking at here. But what if I could take those characters and get some control over them for myself? Uh, what if I could start to add space and size um, to the characters? Or what if I could even change the font? And I, what you see here is sort of a dramatization of, of how um, dramatic it can be if we can give people control over their reading experience and really create something um, that is a lot easier to read than perhaps what their eyes perceive in a book. And what I'm sharing with you here um, are, the, are the work that Readability Matters has been doing over about the last 15 years. And they came and showed Adobe uh, some of the work they were doing, which basically said that if you can give people this control over, over their reading um, experience, if you can find a font that works for a particular individual, if they can control the size, the line height, and then for those people who um, have problem with that crowding that I was showing you, um, even the intercharacter spacing, um, you can in fact create uh, a sort of digital version of these magic reading glasses. Um, Adobe was, we were intrigued um, by the work that they were doing. And so what we do when we, when we find an intriguing theory is we prototype it. And what I'm showing you here is a prototype we built about four years ago um, on an iPad where we took a PDF on the left, we added some new technology that we were working on at the time um, called Project Colorado, which turned into liquid mode. And I'll be telling you about that in a minute, but it gives you control over a PDF, allows you to reflow it. And then this is what a prototype UI looks like. We don't expect anybody to really use it um, today, but it gave uh, us control over the formatting of the document so that we could go from what you see on the left to what you see on the right. Um, and in this case, that's one of the formats uh, that we wanted to use. And we took our prototype into a school in South San Jose, California, where we, where we worked with about 80 students. There were uh, 33 students in the third grade um, and, um, and I think 47 in the seventh grade that we tested with. And of course, 
We started with a baseline test um, where we used a common format that the kids were reading at the time. Um, and we found that we had a wide range of readers. The fastest reader was reading at uh, 163 words a minute, but the slowest reader was reading at 69 uh, words a minute, uh, almost a hundred words per minute slower. And uh, the teachers were quite worried about this student. Um, he was receiving, um, certainly receiving uh, individual attention. A reading specialist was working with him. His parents were working with him. Um, and we were actually measuring these kids at the end of March. So they'd been in school for almost seven months. Um, and in that seven months, seven months, he'd made no progress um, in his reading skills. Um, and I think as many of you know, um, a third grade student should be increasing in their fluency score by about one word a week um, at that age. So uh, he was at risk, um, not only of um, having to repeat the third grade, but probably of never turning into a, a very good reader. What we did with our prototype was we tested a series of formats and found the format that best fit um, each child in the class. And when we did, we saw reading yields that looked like this. So this little guy that we were worried about jumped 27 words a minute. He jumped from the at-risk category um, into solidly into the middle um, of the next category. His teachers were quite thrilled um, with what they saw and heard. And if you listen to the, vit, to the audio tape, um, you hear a child who is stumbling and sounding out one word at a time in his baseline study. Um, to a child who is reading with inflection and with meaning um, when we found a format that worked best for him. Now, the other really cool thing about this set of data, if we zoom up to the fastest student, um, the slowest student jumped 27 words a minute, which was great. So did the fastest student. And so the takeaway from this slide is that when we talk about individualized reading formats, we are talking about a, a, a reading um, improvement across the spectrum. Uh, so we believe that we can help people who struggle with reading, but we can also help some of the very best readers. And we're gonna go on and talk about that in a few minutes. If you, another way to look at this data, the class jumped uh, um, an average of 20 words a minute um, in their reading scores when they read with their own individualized format. We talked a minute ago about the fact that we expect these students to increase their fluency about one word per week. Um, and yet these kids jumped 20 words, which is equal to 20 weeks and did it, you know, in roughly a minute by changing the settings of the text. Um, so 50% of the class uh, jumped 20 words or more. We saw similar improvements in grade seven, not quite as dramatic. These kids were good readers already. They were reading um, on average in the 73rd percentile. Um, and also it's, an, out, it's, a, it's a, an oral test. You're reading out loud and you can only speak so quickly. Um, but, but nevertheless, we did see really encouraging results. And, as the, and we were giving the, um, the reader control over these five uh, font characteristics. So, yeah, we think perhaps we can come up with this sort of um, uh, mythical pair of individualized reading glasses. And we have decided to put some of this technology into Adobe Acrobat, the free version, as well as the paid version um, that you can download um, on your devices. So we call it liquid mode, um, as I talked to you uh, a few minutes ago about. Um, it's available for mobile devices today because we think that's where the largest problem is in reading PDFs. So you can get it um, at the app store for your iPhone or your iPad, for Android phones and tablets, as well as Play Store compatible Chromebooks. Uh, Play Store compatible means you can download an app and install it. We didn't, we haven't yet gotten all five of the characteristics that we originally tested. Um, today, you can change size, spacing and line height. Um, we're working on font, but it turns out to be a lot harder than we thought, but we hope to have that uh, very soon. So very quickly, for those of you who haven't played with liquid mode, here is a document on a phone. It's a research document. It happens to be one of the very first research papers that we wrote um, as a result of the, the work that we're doing and that I'll tell you about in a minute. And if you pulled this up on your phone because somebody sent it to you, the first thing you'd start doing is pinching and zooming 
um, and pretty soon you probably lose your place. Um, and you'd say, well, you know, maybe I'll just go read it on my on my laptop when I have a chance. But um, if you can invoke liquid mode, which you can do now, and press it, we reflow the document uh, right down um, the, the window of the phone as though it were an HTML document, um, which is pretty good, but we're still in a one size fits all world uh, at this point. So now let's invoke the reading settings and um, customize it. So I'm gonna pump the size of the font up a couple of times, and I'm gonna pump up the character spacing a little bit, uh, as well as the inner line spacing. And now um, I have a document that for my particular um, eyeballs is gonna work much better for me um, than the reflow document here. That's, that font is just a little too small and a little too crowded for, um, for the way my eyes work. Um, I'd rather look at it this way. Uh, let me give you another example. This is a real world example. We're doing a lot of work in adult education um, and uh, we're piloting a program starting this week um, in Maryland with adult, uh, in an adult education class. Primarily the uh, students in this class are newly arrived immigrants. Um, they arrive in this country, in many cases, not reading, um, and in many cases, not knowing English. Um, and what they want to do is, um, is get a job, and many of them target um, commercial truck driving as, as one of the um, options that are available to them. But to do so, they need to learn to read, and they want to be able to uh, read the driver's license manual. So that, in fact, is what is used in the classroom um, to teach reading. Again. Most of these people have only one digital device and it's a phone, it's not a laptop. Um, and this is what the document looks like when they pull it up um, on their phone. Not, you're not gonna learn to read with this um, format, but with, with, but with um, liquid mode, we can reflow it. Um, and with the reading controls, we can now personalize it to each of these readers. Um, so as I say, this is going into pilot study right now. And, I hope uh, maybe if I talk to you next year, we can tell you how it went. I keep mentioning studies. Um, what the work we've done so far does in my um, estimation is just raise a whole bunch of questions and questions mean research. So we're also undertaking that research. If you think about the uh, example of Gutenberg that we talked about a few minutes ago, um, it's been over 600 years that we've been reading this one size fits all printed page. Um, but it's been very recent in, in terms of uh, the history of reading um, that we've been reading digitally and not a whole lot of research has been done in this time. So there are questions like, are there three formats that work for everybody or is it infinite? Um, what are the most readable fonts? Uh, and I will tell you that the research we've done so far says that the biggest impact you can make if you're only gonna change one thing is to find the right font for a reader. Um, but the question is, how do we help people find that font or, or, or that format? Um, and that's something that we're drilling into hard right now. And another um, study that we're undertaking starting this summer is we know that a lot of students lost school time or lost progress um, in reading over the last year and a half because of COVID, is there a way that we can use some of our theories um, to help bridge that gap? Now to do that, um, we're underwriting a new digital reading lab at the University of Central Florida under the direction of Dr. Ben Sawyer, one of the country's leading uh, reading researchers. Um, and we've built uh, what we call the virtual reading lab. We originally planned on a physical reading lab, but uh, COVID made all of us uh, sort of change what we were going to do. And so we built everything online and we built a whole test suite of reading testing tools um, that can be deployed um, here on our virtual readability lab. Uh, this is, I'm just going to back up a minute. Um, so not only um, is Adobe underwriting the research at University of Central Florida. Uh, we are also now supporting Readability Matters and the great work that they do. And um, we're working together um, to make this lab a reality. This is what the lab looks like. It is actually a framework for testing. And what you see here are three um, studies that we're fielding at the moment, but, but you can plug and play studies into this space. Um, and on the back end, we have a whole series of 
tools uh, that one needs in order to study um, reading. And those are all available to people who use the lab. We plan to open source this lab um, to researchers around the world um, to push uh, the state of the art in digital reading um, forward as fast as we can. And we'll be making announcements about that later. Um, we've attracted a lot of people to this uh, project. We have over 50 researchers around the world um, using some of our tools or collaborating with us um, through uh, the lab at UCF. Um, these are just a few of them. It's actually very hard for me to keep this uh, slide um, up to date. Um, in, in addition to working with Readability Matters, we're working with readworks.org, who somebody of you might know, and then World Education is heading up our pilots with in the adult ed space. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the research. Let me see what we've got for time. I think we've, we're going to have time for questions in a minute, um, but let me just um, share with you some exciting new research that has yet to be published, um, but we've got the data in um, and it's really encouraging. And basically, this is work that's been done um, out of Chapman University uh, under the direction of Dr. Shannon Shepard, um, working with Sophie Beyer of um, the Royal Academy of Art in Copenhagen and uh, with Suzanne Nobles of Readworks. What we, we, we've been doing a lot of work that um, we can talk about later in fluency, in other words, how fast people can read, but very little work has been done on comprehension. This is one of the first studies we know about um, that measures comprehension um, as a result of individualized formatting. And what we found that was that when we individualized the formats, um, we could jump on, on a word basis. We had uh, over 20% um, jump. Actually, we had the same jump both on words and passages. So in, in the word task we did, we just flashed words up and, and measured whether or not people understood the word. In the passage task, the students actually read through um, several paragraphs and then answered questions. And in both cases, when uh, measure, if we measure the worst format and the best format for each student, and these students were um, in grades K to eight, um, we saw an over 20% jump in comprehension. And the other interesting thing um, about this particular study is that that roughly 20% jump held true across all grade levels from K through eight, um, which we found um, quite encouraging. Um, and then just one child, just to, to sort of personalize it, we had one uh, girl in the seventh grade who was really neutral on reading, um, to say the least. Uh, if she was going to read for pleasure, she was going to read comic books. When we measured her best format against her worst format, we found that her word speed increased by 33%. And her passage accuracy increased by 34%. She went from 66% comprehension to 100% comprehension. And so if you're going to give a letter grade to that, she went from a D to an A. Um, best format versus uh, uh, worst format versus best format. Um, with that, let me pause for questions and see if anything's come up so far. Rick, we've got two good ones. Uh, will text to speech be a future integration to liquid mode for low vision, LD, et cetera? So the answer is that text to speech um, is available in, um, in regular reader already. Um, and uh, we've got a new release. I, in fact, I just was reading the, the release notes this morning. There's a new release out on Android that has improved the text to speech. Um, I haven't played with it myself, but text to speech is. Um, a, um, a feature of Adobe Reader already. Um, it is not the same. I will say that um, the text-to-speech that you may have played with in Microsoft's Immersive Reader um, highlights each word um, as it speaks it. We, we are not at that stage yet. Gotcha, thanks. And then the other one, will this be available in the desktop Acrobat application at some point? At some point. Um, I am uh, uh, pushing the team very hard uh, to do that. Um, I'm on the research side. I don't control the product, um, but we are showing um, the, uh, the product team that it's needed. Um, and we're actually pushing hard to get it into um, the uh, 
browser version, um, probably before it shows up on the desktop version. Um, my, my goal is to get it uh, easily uh, used in Chromebooks for, for education uh, first. So that's on the way, but I can't tell you uh, when it might show up. I, uh, but let me just say that, remember, if your students are using Chromebooks, um, you can use this on a full screen Chromebook by installing the same app that you put on the phone. And that's all the questions. I see Ariel's back on screen, so she's probably going to be a timekeeper here. I just want to hop on and yeah. let everyone know that they can ask any questions on that cult channel if anything got missed. Um, this will also be uploaded to the hub if you guys need to access it later. Um, if, are there any other questions? If not, I can show. I'm, generally, I'm, I'm always braced for the question, what are you doing about dyslexia? Um, would, and I'm uh, a little surprised we haven't been asked yet, but um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to show you one more study that we did that, yes, that I find pretty interesting. One of our, we do, um, we, we do a uh, exercise every year that we call Hack Week. And during Hack Week, all of our engineers um, in the document cloud basically have a week to pursue a passion project. And one of the engineers, um, a woman named um, Alina um, just is, is herself dyslexic and notice that we didn't, and, and has always used a physical ruler when she reads printed text, um, but didn't have access to a physical ruler um, digitally and wondered if she could hack one into liquid mode and whether or not it would help dyslexic readers. And um, wanted to test it against a, uh, control group. So she also asked the question, what about non-dyslexic readers? Um, and uh, if a highlighter was going to work, was it, would it be the same highlighter for everybody? Um, so she tested four versions of highlighting. Uh, she asked people to follow with her mouse, um, to use an underline, to use what she called the light box, uh, white on gray, and then the inverse of the white on gray, which was gray on white. Um, and she used um, the virtual readability lab framework uh, that I showed you a few minutes ago and worked with one with an intern um, and one of the people who has stayed with the project for three years, um, a guy named Sean Wallace, who actually did most of the architecture. Um, he's at Brown University and a PhD candidate there. And what she learned um, and as a result of her study was that it's not just dyslexics, but it's everybody um, can benefit from a ruler by quite a bit. Um, the dyslexic people in the study um, benefited, as you can see, um, from a ruler. So did the people without dyslexia. Um, but which ones are better? Well, it turned out that the underlying rulers um, helped the dyslexic people as well as the light box rulers. Um, but that no one ruler um, works for everybody. And so this goes back to our original hypothesis that Reading is extremely individual, and the more we can give people individual controls, um, the better, even when it comes to uh, a tool uh, like a ruler. So most benefits, uh, most readers benefit from rulers, different from different designs. And then the, the kind of kicker to the whole thing was that the dyslexic readers did better with rulers designed by a dyslexic, um, and, the obvious, and the obvious was uh, true as well. And the non-dyslexic readers responded better to designer designs by non-dyslexics. <clears throat> so um, it just goes to our to to um, underscore um, our notion that reading is personal, and the more we can build tools um, for personalized reading, the better. But that we have a lot of work to do on the research side. Um, so we'd love to have people join us. Um, you can write to me, uh, tritman at adobe.com. You can write to readable at adobe.com. You can play uh, with the readability lab at readabilitylab.xyz. And if you're interested in, um, I'm, I think I lost the slide, but um, if you're interested in um, working with us on our um, reading recovery uh, study around, um, around the COVID reading loss that so many people um, experienced. Um, we'd love to have you contact uh, us and um, I can give you more information there. Um, that's another study that's being run out of UCF. And with that, um, we're probably at time. Um, if there are any final questions, I'm happy to answer them.
Rick, great job. I think there was one that, that came up and it was around uh, accuracy of translations of historical documents or grammar issues that need to be maintained in order to understand the meaning of the document. We're not doing any translations. I'm not sure I understand the question. That was from Jeff Turkowski. Maybe we can connect. Jeff, you can yeah. connect with Rick via his email address here. Yeah, I, we're, we're not changing the words of the document at all. We're not translating anything, but we are changing. We are giving the user um, control over the, the, the formatting characteristics of the document. All right, Ariel, we're we'll turning it back over to you as the session host. Thanks Alrighty, for perfect, your time. guys. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. And thanks for putting up with the Zoom technical issues there for a little bit. <laughs> See you guys at the next meeting. All right, great.